Good afternoon. Hopefully you've got a couple of cookies in you now with some sodas or whatever, and uh, you'll be set for a little bit. So uh, my name is Jeremy Wilkin. I'm a developer at eBay, and I work on our internal data system. So uh, we help build interfaces for internal employees to be able to access the wealth of information that's available. And that's actually a big problem. And one of the things that we needed to do was create a, a, the ability to access that information from anywhere. And as we discovered, we went with the Ionic framework. And so you may have had this question asked to you before. Uh, how many of you have tried to build a mobile app before? Okay. How many of you tried with like a native style with the Xcode or Android tools? Okay. How many of you actually succeeded? That was fewer than all of you. So the issue with it is actually not the simplest thing in the world right now when you talk about building native mobile apps and you also have platforms to build for each of them separately. But let's just take a moment and think you have a client, and that client is a resort, and they want an app for their, uh, for their customers to come in, and it would have the reservation information, it would have the local events, it maybe would show uh, a menu items that they could order room service directly from their phone and have it delivered. All these kinds of things that uh, you could imagine that a resort would possibly want to expose. So what I did was go ahead and, and make a demo of something that does much of that. And when we talk about building mobile apps, there's a few things that you're probably going to want or need as you develop. You want something that's native quality. It's got to be fast, performant. It's going to need to be smooth. People need to be able to use it. You want to build it one time. You don't want to be building for every single platform that comes along. You want to build it once and cross-deploy. You want to use the technologies you know. You want to have components and things built in, ready for you to consume, so that you're not recreating every single element on this page. You want to be able to do it quickly. It's about speed, isn't it? We want to be able to do this as quick as we can without sacrificing quality. And we want to use the tools we already know. Don't make me download your own uh, IDE in order to make all this work. Let me just use Sublime or fill in your favorite text editor, and I want it to work. So you can see here this app, while I've built it with Ionic, looks just like what a native iOS 7 app might look like. So as you can read the concise definition of the Ionic framework from their GitHub README, I think it actually leaves you with a few questions than it does answers. So it says Ionic is the open source HTML5 mobile framework for building amazing cross-platform hybrid native apps with HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. If that's not a mouthful, <laughs> I don't know what is. There's a lot of things in it, so let's dissect that just a little bit and learn a little bit about what a hybrid app actually is so you can understand then what Ionic and the other technologies that are going to work together do in order to create your mobile app. So first, you have this stack of technologies. At the very bottom, you have a device, and your device is your mobile phone, tablet, is going to be running Android or iOS, and that's, that's the physical hardware. And it has a certain way of communicating with apps. And Cordova is an open source project which communicates between the device using the SDKs that are on the platform and a browser instance. So it creates a browser instance to communicate between, and you can get access to the GPS uh, to the camera, anything that you can access with the native SDKs. Um, this was earlier, they were talking about the, how browsers on the mobile platforms are getting better and accessing more of the hardware. Well, all that's available to you now. It's just a matter of communicating between uh, the, the device and the browser using Cordova's built in plugins and wrappers. Then we have Angular. So, those of you who are not familiar with Angular, don't worry. But Angular is going to be the foundation for your web application that's going to run inside of that browser. And Ionic sits alongside of Angular to create the UI and the functionalities that you saw with the side menus and the tabs. So real brief, it's a web application that loads inside of a native app wrapper. It's like packaging up your mobile, uh, your web application. Instead of putting it on a server, it runs directly on the phone. And Cordova facilitates that communication. Angular is the, the foundation of your web application. And Ionic is a lot of the UI elements that you get to use, similar to like Bootstrap. So Ionic is 
A few other things, though. I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into it, because it's not just the set of UI components, but that is the big thing. And it lets you build with those technologies you already know. But the components come in two flavors. And if you're familiar with something like Bootstrap, you'll, you'll see there's similarities. There is a CSS type component. And I'll show you an example, but it's essentially a set of class names that you use to apply to any kind of an element, and it will transform that into that particular component, whether it's a button, it could be a list type, it could be avatars, badges, any number of things. They've got dozens of these different CSS-based components. Then you have JavaScript components, which are, if you're familiar with Angular, they're Angular directives, but they're used like HTML tags. All you have to do is place an HTML element into your template, into your HTML, and you can adopt the functionality. It's abstracted and wrapped around uh, inside of the Angular directive. You don't have to worry about, well, how do the side menus work? You declare them, and they're automatically uh, made available and functional for you. It also has a set of services, which is something that it's a JavaScript object that can manipulate the page programmatically. So it's not just the HTML, but it also has a set of services. Depending on the type of feature, um, they're very consistent on which type uh, makes sense in which situations. Really, it comes down to it's like the missing mobile SDK for the mobile platform for building uh, apps that actually have the controls that are used on, on mobile apps. So it works with Angular. You don't have to know Angular, I think, to get started. You'll see it, and you have to kind of wade through some fundamentals. The examples that are out there kind of gloss over the parts that are Angular and try to focus on the parts that are Ionic. But Angular is really going to be about your business logic, loading your data. But you have the same uh, access to everything that you can do inside of a web application. where You can load in additional modules for Angular that will do things like real-time streaming with Socket.io. And these things are already pre-made and available out there. And you can just include them into your project. It's actually quite beautiful. Everything's very clean. It's very well designed and thought through. Each component uh, matches the style guides for iOS and Android. They try very, very hard to make sure that when you deploy your app, uh, that the style guidelines are very similar or identical to what's possible with the native app. And so it's very beautiful, and you can simply you can uh, customize it yourself as well. Um, it has SAS built. It's built using SAS, so you can apply your own variables to modify some of the base colors or some of the base designs as you see fit. Performance is a big issue, and on the mobile apps today, uh, the, the mobile browsers actually are getting really good. Um, I saw a tweet today. I don't know if this is really true, but it apparently benchmarked that iOS 8 uh, with the Safari browser, which launched today, uh, is four times faster uh, in processing than the iOS 7 version of Safari. So browsers on the mobile device are getting to the point where it's almost indistinguishable from performance inside of the native platform. It's like the difference between writing your web application or actually building out an application that people have to buy the CD and install like they used to do. They also minimize things like jQuery, minimize external dependencies. It's all written from scratch to access the hardware acceleration and be as quick as possible. So nothing is just brought in to try and cobbled together. Everything was built from the ground up. And uh, one really good example I'll demonstrate later is the collection repeat. But they have extra things they've built in just to, uh, because of performance reasons. And the real big highlight is everything's focused on the native platform. It's still the website, but it looks, feels native. I keep saying that because it's such a groundbreaking thing that other types of mobile uh, applications uh, haven't been able to do for hybrid apps. There's things like jQuery Mobile and, and several other things that give you uh, the ability to build sort of OK UIs, but none of them have the fine-tuned uh, design as well as then have all the access to Cordova APIs to access the actual hardware. So it's very much about the native uh, implementation. Ionic also then has a CLI tool, so a command line tool. So it can do a number of things. It can start a project. It can emulate from the command line. You can start a local development server, which allows you to preview your app quickly in the browser, and then also build out to your production servers. They also have 
many more plans for adding new features to the CLI. So as, as things go on, um, there'll be more features even that you won't even have to pull up other tools. You can pretty much install Ionic CLI tool and everything is available to you. And something that's really important to me, it's open source. Uh, there's a community behind it. There are uh, nearly 10,000 people have started on GitHub. It's got, I don't know how many followers on Twitter, but quite a, quite a few. Um, there's a huge community, a huge interest. And that community <coughs> spirit is, is pulling through. The forum is very active. There's lots of posts on Stack Overflow. So it's not something that's just a passing project. It's not somebody's pet project. It's a real thing. There's a company behind it. Drifty is the name of the company. And they have a community manager who is full time just focused on helping people out, making sure their questions are answered. It's MIT licensed. That's also really important. That means you can use it commercial, non-commercial, doesn't matter. Um, there's also a font, font icon library that's available to you that are designed to match the guidelines of either the Android style or the iOS 7 style where you have the very thin lines. So they've thought through a lot of things and it's very clean and comprehensive. And you can see on their website at the showcase page uh, a list of some of the fairly prominent apps that are currently available in the app stores that you can download and see what they're actually like. And you, you can see they have some of those similar things that side menus and features like that, but they'll have put their own flair into it as well. So some really beautiful uh, showcases and some functional ones that uh, are actually quite popular. So hopefully you think that sounds pretty neat. It sounds like something that's got a lot of features, a lot of potential, but how do you actually build something with it? How does this, what does it take for me to build an app? Well, okay, first, obvious thing is you're gonna install Ionic and Cordova. Simple node package, so if you're familiar with node, you npm install, make them global. Once you've installed that, then you just do your start project. You have a brand new project that will be downloaded. Uh, every time you start a project, it's gonna download the latest version of the starter app, which is gonna be the most current version of everything. And you'll get a basic app that'll show up and be like, hello world, and it's a foundation for you to begin on. Now here's where you've got to get the most creative, is actually writing your application. You've got to decide what you're going to put in it. So you pull up your editor and go. You write JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and you, you keep working on it. And then once you've started to write, you preview it. And there are three main ways of previewing. You have a browser, you have the actual device, and you have an emulator. So for people on, you know, for me, I don't have a, an Android device on me right now, so I would have to use an Android emulator to make uh, to be able to preview and see what it's like on an Android device. And lastly, you're, when you're done, you're able to build and deploy out to any of the platforms. Right now, we are uh, able to do iOS and Android. Plan support for um, Windows 8 and Firefox OS are, are in the works. Um, I know people are trying to build for Windows 8. I've seen forum posts about it, and they're like, this doesn't work. Well. It's, un, it's known, it's not completely supported yet, but it's on the roadmap and vision uh, to support a wider array of platforms. But they started with the two core largest uh, platforms. So that very beginning demo that you saw, how, how did I make that? I'm gonna show you a number of the components that were used and a little bit about how they're implemented. But let's take a little bit of a closer look at that app. So I'm going to build, go. Oh dear. There we go. So this is an emulator for iOS. And so I think that's actually still there. So it gives you the experience of what it's actually like. So the, I can use my mouse to actually simulate touch events. So I'm gonna be swiping able to do a tour. <coughs> I can get started. Let's say the, they emailed me my private reservation code I could use to log in. And all of a sudden we can see here we're loading current weather, hopefully if the internet works. There it goes. Um, Things are actually loading and being responsive. So we can click on the forecast and we can see we have a nice loading screen. We have a nice list here that we can scroll up and down through. We're able to open our side menu. 
we can click on reservation and see, well, what did we actually book? Okay, well, we're checking in today. We check out in a week. Uh, our room service date, oh, yada, yada, yada. I made all this up, so it's not real. There's also events. Um, this information is also being loaded from an external source, and you can just see long lists that you can just keep scrolling and scrolling. I don't show you, but there's also like infinite scrolling available. There are tabs. You can be able to flip between these different tab areas, and as you scroll down, let's say I scroll down, change tabs, and I can come back, and I'm actually still at the same place. Like it doesn't reset the view, it's actually remembering where I was inside. So those tabs keep their own state and memory as well. And let's just say you're hungry. You want, uh, you know, it's getting later in the day, let's say we want some dinner. You know, I want, you know, I'm from Texas, so uh, you know, chicken fried chicken. Put that on my order and I want some ice cream. So you have these swipeable buttons you've seen in various places and those buttons are able to hook into some sort of activity. You can decide what to do once that's been tapped, whether it's delete, uh, it can be edit. In this case, it's adding items to my order and preview and uh, that's good, submit. And hopefully in 30 minutes, I'll have food. So in short, you've seen a, a lot of different parts and if I've tried to nail down exactly what components I use, it's actually really difficult because it's just so many things that have been kind of melded together. These are like cards. You've seen them on Google Now and things like this. Very, uh, very popular, and you can make them so they can swipe if you want to like remove a card. So let's flip back and see how this has been implemented. I use 375 lines of HTML. A lot of that is directives and uh, some of the boilerplate stuff that just needs to be in. So you have to declare like each of you. I use 26 lines of custom CSS. Most of it was for the tour because that's. Um, something I had to, I used what's a slide box and I just made it sit on top of some of the other elements to make it full screen. And 275 lines of JavaScript. This includes white space, by the way. So it's actually condensed down probably about by 20% or so. I like a lot of white space. So really, this isn't so bad. And by the way, I wrote this at about 2 a.m. Uh, in the past week, uh, holding my infant daughter. Um, so if I can do this at 2 a.m., I'm thinking you guys can do quite a bit more and a lot faster and a lot better. So <coughs> side menus. This is one of my favorites because it's very easy, a very logical interaction, but you have just this markup. These are um, Angular directives, and ion side menus is the container for it. And if you use them in conjunction with these other directives, they logically follow kind of the DOM structure you already are thinking about. So you have, uh, you have the ability here to declare a nav bar, which is actually off screen here, and a nav view. But the side menu, you see, there's an attribute here for side equals left. So you're actually able to pass attributes to configure some of these components. And you don't have to write JavaScript to say, hey, I want you on the left side, or I want you on the right side, or I want, I want one on each. You can just write this as HTML, which I like because it makes it declarative. It makes it very clear when I look at this page, what is it, what's happening? I'm not looking at JavaScript. I'm looking at markup because that's really what I see on the left side there in the, in the graphic. Lists are also um, used quite a bit. And this is a CSS example where there's no custom elements. It's just applying a few classes and you get a particular styling. So you have an item divider. Um, there are additional styles you can use, like badges that float to the side that have numbers like notifications three and a little red badge. Or uh, you have an avatar image if you have maybe a list of contacts. You want their little uh, gravatar or something like that. So they have a, a combination of different <coughs> styles that can be applied. You have more complex lists I showed as you swipe to the side. Um, you also have lists that if you hit a button, you can see reordering buttons, or you could drag and drop the, the list items into a different order, or delete them. Um, all of these are available through complex lists. So you have a list and item uh, custom element, as well as the option buttons here. And so as you start to work with Angular, you can see as you loop over things, you get to use uh, some of the Angular syntax, but Ultimately, you're mostly interacting with the Ionic components as you do it. So it's a nice combination of the two. 
this is the example of performance that they were finding. Let's say you had a thousand, uh, a list of a thousand orders. On your phone, you've only got the ability to see maybe 10 at a time. So if you've got a thousand items and you want to loop over and make a list, are you going to make a thousand items in the page and actually create a DOM element for 1,000 items? That's not really a good idea because you're going to have a lot of extra overhead in keeping that in memory and scrolling through a thousand items. So collection repeat is their solution. It's essentially in the window, they add and remove items on top or bottom as needed. As you scroll up, things are appended to the bottom. As you scroll down, things are appended to the top and removed from the bottom. So let's say there are 10 in view, there may be 20 total added, five on top and five on bottom. So they keep a really good uh, uh, performance with this and it also keeps that memory low. So this was their solution to what was a problem at the beginning when I was first starting with Ionic was very slow rendering on large lists. Tabs was showed. It's tabs inside a tab item. So very, very simple, straightforward to see how to declare them. You declare a title and an icon, and the, the icon library is available to you there. So it makes it real simple to make uh, any number of tab types. And you don't have to use what's this called this ion nav view. Um, that's what you use in order to create the state, to remember where you are at each time. Um, if you don't care about that, you don't even have to use that extra layer of features and functionality. There's also a CSS only version of tabs. If you just want the styling for whatever reason, you don't actually need uh, the history in the, in the memory. The slide box was at the beginning, very similar to tabs. It's just instead of being sideways, it's sliding back and forth. This is an example of one of the services. When you want to see one of these action sheets that slide up from the bottom, give you context, you want to share or modify or delete an item. It's really nice to have uh, that kind of abstracted out into the service because it doesn't always make sense to be an HTML element. Because when does this show? It only shows after a certain event has happened, usually when you tap on some sort of a button. So, it doesn't make sense to be um, just an HTML element like we've seen in the other examples. It's actually something that you would trigger on an event. And so the service is available, so ion action sheet dot show, and you configure whatever it needs to say, configure what the buttons do when you tap them, and automatically those things will appear and make it possible. I like this one. Um, there's also the inverse of uh, infinite scroll is very similar to this, where as you pull down, you've seen this, you want to reload your stocks, you want to reload your um, Twitter feed, you just pull down and wait for that little spinner to stop and it'll tell you new stuff. All you have to do is to declare the UI component and then your refresh data method, which will be in your controller, you'll have to declare what happens, which will obviously go out load data and when it's done, it'll, you'll just say stop. And navigation, that's actually a really big topic and I'm glossing over a lot with it because it's gonna be a, a whole chapter, but it's very much uh, built into the underpinnings of the Ionic framework. So there's the button there on the left, the back button. Um, as you navigate around, you can go deeper and deeper into views. It's not like regular web applications where you have an address bar and a back button in the browser. You are entirely dependent as the user on whatever interface the developer makes. So if I don't put a back button there, there's no way for me to go back. So instead of having to actually manually decide at what point do I need a back button, with your navigation uh, setup, you declare routes and you declare a route hierarchy as well. And that's possible then to automatically decide when can I go back and when can I not go back. For example, if you're on the home screen, you probably don't need to go back because where are you going back to? Your, your home. But if you're in a subpage of the home screen, then maybe you go back. Or if you have a list and you click on one of the orders and you see the full order, you want to be able to go back. So it's contextual and you're able to say as well when it should show and when it should not. So as we kind of look out, we project forward, there's some other things that we might be interested in. Something called Ionic Creator is not yet available. They're um, taking email addresses if you want to learn about it very soon. It is a way to visually design apps. So it's going to be a, a service that you can drag and drop a lot of 
these elements onto a screen and it will help produce an Ionic project for you. So especially for those of you who are starting and want to get kind of the, uh, the more complex interfaces designed without having to think through exactly when do I do this or that, you're able to get the foundation put together, download it, and then you can actually finish it off yourself, get the data loading in there. Um, I'm not entirely sure what all happened because they've not yet released all the information, but when I talked to them briefly, uh, it sounds like a pretty, pretty amazing tool. They're also talking about a build service, which would be through their um, uh, CLI tool. So when you are on a Windows machine, you cannot build for iOS because Apple decided uh, they don't want you to. They want you to buy a Mac because they think it's best for every developer to have a Mac. I guess that makes business sense, but they're kind of stuck up about it. So what can happen, though, is a build service can exist where you can send your files to them and they'll automatically create it for you, whether you're on Windows, Linux, doesn't matter. They'll have everything set up and configured to build for every platform they support. And then they'll send you back the built assets that you can then upload to the store. So build service will eventually be available as well. Uh, I mentioned support for Firefox OS and Windows 8. Version 1.0 stable is looming. Um, when exactly, I don't know. They've been adding little features and fixing a lot of bugs as we go. With the landing of iOS 8, I'm pretty sure they were waiting to see what was going to happen with that uh, before they cut their 1.0 stable. So that, uh, when that's available, you can expect it to be very set in stone, and you won't have to worry about API changes anymore. Um, the betas, they've been making some minor changes, not so much in the last two or three months, but the first few months they did. Um, and plenty more that I can't quite yet fathom, but I know they've got other plans, um, and it'll be pretty interesting to see what all they can come up with. So if you're interested in getting started, you go to ionicframework.com. If you're interested in contributing, you go to the Ionic project on GitHub, star it, follow it, just see what's going on. Lots of stuff going on. Uh, it's really, really cool to watch. And uh, that's all I have on, as well. My book, Ionic in Action, just launched uh, the early access version. So if you want to follow along as I'm writing, I'd love to have you along and help me improve that book as well. So that's all I have. Do we have any questions? Yes. Caveats? Uh, so the question is, are there any caveats to working with Ionic? And I think the, the biggest caveat is understanding the whole tech stack and understanding each place. Um, when you talk about learning Angular, for example, and having to use it, how much of Angular do you need to know and actually understand to be able to create a, an app. And I think that's, that's a bit of a caveat because you need to know the basics. Um, I don't think you have to be an advanced person in developing Angular applications, but it is important to understand enough of it so that you know what's the difference between it being a, a problem that I need to fix with Ionic and a problem I need to fix in Angular. Um, so I think that's probably one of the bigger issues is understanding the whole tech stack. Yes? Is that possible? So the question is, can you scale this up into either an iPad app or into a desktop app? So when you load it up in a desktop experience like this, things, uh, I haven't tested it on this large screen because I wasn't intending to. Um, if we get past this, I think the styles will look better. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Once I get past this, it's fine. So if I scale this back up. So you can see it actually adopts the entire browser width. It's designed to fit whatever browser size it's in. It has a few breakpoints. Um, if I open a modal like this, on the mobile app it looked different because it was wider, so it took up the whole screen. But now that we're on a really large screen, or if this was an iPad, it gives a slightly different experience. 
Um, something else they recently added was um, the ability to keep this open if you're in a landscape mode on iPad. So they're thinking about this experience. It's possible to use. Uh, it's not limiting to you to adjust the, to the phone or to the phone and vertical. It's usually the easiest to start with that. But as far as landscape mode or iPads or even desktops, it's possible. But the weird thing about doing this on a desktop is touch is not usually available. So it becomes a little bit more interesting to figure out the right user experience in both situations. So I don't always recommend it for like a desktop experience. It's not, it's, the component tree is usually different. So I, I don't think that always makes sense. In the back. So I've heard nothing but criticism for phone caps So your the question is about how how performant is it particularly because it's using PhoneGap or Cordova is part of PhoneGap uh, and you you've heard criticisms about the performance and quality um, compared to native apps and certainly native apps are going to be closer to the platform because they're written in the same language and until recently browsers on the mobile devices weren't that great it just wasn't a big deal for uh, Apple and Google to really make them good. And I don't know why, but you saw earlier uh, she had the nice browser versioning information. Um, you can see in the past year or so that's really ramped up and changed. So older devices, that is true. Today, newer devices, that is really not the case. Performance is, is very good. Um, I'm happy to show you that demo running on my phone. You can feel how, how well it's working. And um, Ultimately, when it comes down to it, the, the speed is reliable, uh, reliant on the version that you're using. If you're running Android 2 something, yeah, I can't help you out a whole lot, but if you're on Android 4 or iOS 7 or better, things are going to be pretty smooth. Someone else? Yes. So the question is, how much control do you have over the animations, and particularly as they keep developing new animations like Google's Material? Um, I do know they're looking uh, to implement material design inside of the framework. Um, they have a job opening entirely for that. So if you're interested, you can check that out. Um, they don't currently have that. Um, control over the animations, a lot of them are actually classes. So you saw some stuff sliding one direction, or you know, modal slide up from the bottom. Uh, they have pre-configured ways of that working. So uh, you can just change the class name and maybe it slides from the top or it slides in from the side. Um, or if you want to go ahead and do it all your own, you can have it just fade in. Um, I don't remember if there's a fade in, but let's say you just take the same styling, give it your own class, and you just use CSS transitions. So they're very much focused on using the CSS uh, animations. So you can override that with your own stuff and you should be pretty, uh, if, you, if you know how to do that, you'd be able to do most of that yourself. Yes? So the question about um, is the code that you write for Angular really any different than what you would write in a traditional Angular application? And, and the answer is no. Um, I structure my mobile app and my desktop apps as far as the code goes identically, exactly the same. Um, that's how I feel most comfortable. And the session before this was about AngularJS structures, and I thought that was interesting. I don't necessarily agree with all their opinions, but that's why they're opinions. So um, when you put together an AngularJS application, it, it doesn't matter how you structure it, but you're going to be using Angular uh, uh, controllers. You'll be, you should use services, um, and you should use probably some directives if you have to. Um, I haven't built any directives for mobile, by the way. Um, it, the, uh, the available ones have solved all my needs. So, yes. Um, when you're designing an application with Ionic, is it expected that it's going to work exactly the same way on iOS and Android, or you can have to deviate from the That's a great question, and the answer 
the, so the question is, does uh, an Ionic app perform identical on both Android and iOS, or is there something you need to do? Anything that's in the core of Ionic, the directives, those, those components, should work almost the same. But they will try to give a slightly different style or behavior depending on what's normal for Android or iOS. Tabs have a slightly different appearance. And uh, I think, um, so the idea is that they want to actually mold to the platform, not just force one, st one style on both. Um, if there's something you create, then you're going to have to check that on both platforms because it's up to you to make sure that that actually looks uh, the same on both. So especially if you're dealing with um, the native SDKs and trying to pull in information from the phone itself, um, you might need to really check that on multiple platforms yourself. All right. Anything else? Are we at time? Specifically, uh, so the question is, how does uh, how would Ionic use all authentication, particularly with like the accounts that are already on your device? You mean, or sure. Uh, well, because you're building a web application, if you were to implement OAuth authentication inside of an Angular JS app outside of Ionic, it would be identical inside of Ionic. Um, so. As long as you have a connection to the internet, you would be able to access that API in order to exchange the tokens, in order to authenticate the user, and it would load up uh, the experience that says, yes, I authorize such and such app. Um, so that's completely possible. Um, and I also believe there are Cordova plugins that allow you to access the accounts on the device. So if you've set up Twitter on your phone and that's stored in the system, uh, you would be able to ask to, um, instead of having to go out and do that yourself, you could use the plug-in to get that directly from the phone. Anything else? Yes. So does Ionic come with uh, any offline storage capabilities? So the phone, that the app that I'm doing runs offline and online, it just won't be able to load data if it's offline. But uh, you have access to local storage. Uh, if index DB is not going to be in iOS 8, I just saw. So that's a real big bummer. But you have the ability to use a file API and store data inside of the device through Cordova. So you have lots of ways of storing information and making it offline. So by default, yes, it is. Um, it's just making sure that you think through the architecture in case you need to handle an online or offline mode. Same question, great. All right, is that it? Well, thank you very much. Hope you guys build some awesome apps with Ionics.